All right, man, peace. So as we all know, Jason Whitlock, one of the main sports analysts on Fox Sports 1, has not made many friends or allies amongst the woke internet revolutionaries. You know, many of the people who like to talk a lot of shit on the internet about Black Lives Matter and what black people need to be doing, but who really want to hug. Well, he sat down with his partner, Colin Cowherd, and he pretty much did his own roundup of this last week's sports events, including Kobe Bryant's retirement ceremony where they uh, retired his jerseys, as well as the latest events that have befallen the Seattle Seahawks. They're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. Speak for yourself, my friend. Thoughtful, out of the box, great conviction. Jason Whitlock. Who's Jason Whitlock, like he about to tip over. <laughs> Motherfucker look like he's trying to smuggle some food into the movie theater. Who's rarely dressed to this level this early in the day. Only half of me is dressed. It's, it's so, uh, coat and sweat. So there's a couple of different things. First of all, let's get to the Kobe thing yesterday. I got a lot of hate tweets yesterday that uh, I, I was not... Uh, Christine told me she dealt with this too, is that my takeaway on Kobe was, and I think it's your takeaway, Kobe's into Kobe, and I thought that celebration ceremony was a little over the top. You did too. I think the two jerseys, I don't have a problem with the two numbers. They should be on one jersey. What I would look stupid. I have no problem with the two jerseys. I really don't have a problem with the over-the-top retirement ceremony. Kobe Bryant was an over-the-top player. The Lakers are an over-the-top franchise. L.A. is an over-the-top city. Kobe Bryant fans are over-the-top. It's consistent with that theme. I don't think Kobe should separate himself from Magic, Kareem. Right, well, that would go contrary to brand. Kobe has always separated himself. So why not have a ceremony that ceremoniously separates him from everyone else? I think that that's consistent with his nature. It's like when you have a group of superheroes. Every superhero is going to have a different persona based off of the powers that they've been granted. Kobe Bryant's powers are, are are based in his personality that being that he likes to be separate that's why he calls himself the black mamba mambas don't work well with others will gail goodridge jerry west why does he have to have two jerseys i thought it was on brand for kobe he's a bit of a narcissist well yeah he is a narcissist he is a narcissist and for those of you who don't know that the name or that term narcissist uh, it comes from quote unquote Greek mythology. The character of, of Narcissus was someone who was uh, infatuated with his looks. The name Narcissus literally means the son of Cush. Okay, so that's talking about Nimrod. As I touch on intermittently in my videos, the vast majority of ancient quote unquote mythology is basically just the coded history of Nimrod. Many of the films that they show are just coded references to the life of Nimrod. Okay, that there was more than one Nimrod. So the Nimrod that I'm referring to is the son of Cush, who was also known throughout history under under other names: Dionysus, Bacchus, Osiris, uh, Marduk, Saturn, etc. Okay, Kobe Bryant does exhibit some of the characteristics of Narcissus, but most most hyper talented athletes exhibit many of those same traits. Muhammad Ali exhibited the traits of narcissists. Listen, I, I think over the past few years, I'm known as a Kobe hater. Well, most truth tellers about Kobe are known as Kobe haters. I think that as long as you're fair with Kobe, you shouldn't be concerned with what the people have to say. He was an all-time great player, but he is extremely polarizing, as most, um, as most high-level historical figures are in various fields they're going to be polarizing there are very few affluent or quote-unquote important people who are not polarizing um, most people who have strong demeanors strong personalities strong views are going to separate people christ himself tells you in matthew the 12th chapter luke the 13th chapter that he came to bring separation he came to bring division so that happens and by no means am i comparing colby to christ Okay, I'm just saying that 
people who are very impactful, they tend to they tend to cause polarization. Uh, I just find Kobe fascinating, tremendously fascinating. I think he represents. I think he finds himself fascinating. It's something about the modern era of America that we live in and racial politics that really needs to be examined. Because I, I was sitting there blown away going, we're in the middle of the Harvey Weinstein era of the last six months. Yeah. And they're celebrating a guy who has signed documents and an agreement and made a payoff to make some real serious problems go away in Colorado. Right, but that was 13 years ago. That was 13 years ago. So when exactly is the expiration on any form of criminal allegations? How long does it take for certain certain sentiments to go away? I mean, I give Kobe a hard time in regards in regards to certain things. But at the end of the day, that was 13 years ago. Do I believe that something may have happened with that female? Yeah, I do. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. They definitely engage in intercourse. Did Kobe try to force the woman into intercourse? Would it absolutely shock me? No, it wouldn't. Just looking at Kobe's personality. He does border on sociopathy. He is a narcissist. So would it shock me that one thing may have led to another? And maybe he may have stopped the chick from leaving the room and got a little forceful, thinking I'm Kobe Bryant, I should get my way. Would it shock me? No. Am I accusing him of, of doing it exactly in that way? No, not necessarily. But he certainly put himself in a bad position. I never understand why athletes get caught up with these random females when almost anywhere these athletes go, if they were intelligent, they should have some type of contact information to higher level escort services. What is the problem? It keeps you out of trouble. And again, this is not me acting like I know what happened in Colorado. I'm just looking at the facts of the era we're in right now. Men are losing jobs, careers, reputations uh, because they signed agreement. As you can see, Kobe Bryant continues to put his hands together in that prayer formation. Uh, he most likely is a Buddhist. That would not shock me at all. I think I mentioned in a previous video, Buddhism is very, very popular in the entertainment industry. Kyrie Irving's dad, and I believe Kyrie as well, are also Buddhists. Right? And if I'm wrong about that, one of you brothers can correct me. But if I remember correctly, both he and his dad are Buddhists. And many, many people in the entertainment industry are Buddhist. Buddhism is very, very popular in the entertainment industry. Buddhism is an offshoot of the comedic Babylonian mystery school system. That's why their monks shave their heads bald. Um... The ancient comedic priests also shaved their heads bald in veneration of Osiris or quote unquote Nimrod. I touched on this before the original Buddha. The original Buddha. Uh, uh, he was he was a manifestation of Nimrod. Or a terminology for Nimrod. I'm not talking about Gautama Buddha. Agreements or made settlements with people for issues far less than what Kobe sign an agreement for. Kobe's fascinating. Uh, he's a bit polarizing. He's beloved here in Los Angeles. but Beyond beloved. He's worshipped. He's venerated as a god. But polarizing everywhere else. And, you know, I, I, I went to this yesterday. I said, you know, if Magic or Shaq were doing this, they're just more embraceable people. Like, you go to a party sometimes. I, I, I use Chris Berman. Chris Berman, when you watch him on TV, you want to give him a big hug. He looks like you have a beer with him. Yeah. He's a regular guy. Like he, you almost think he's wearing clip-on ties. He's like that guy. Jerry Tarkanian, when I covered him, had that appeal. Jerry wasn't slick. John Calipari's slick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tark wasn't slick. Kobe's always been slick. He almost looked like, came in on his helicopter, he almost looked, if you show the video again, like a spy. They should have retired 007. Well, look, Kobe is a complex person because he's very intelligent. Oftentimes, hyper-intelligent people alienate themselves from other people because they cause a sense of insecurity amongst others. Never underestimate how insecure the average person is about themselves, specifically if they see characteristics or traits in you that they wish that they had. Most overtly outgoing people are very insecure about themselves. The reason why they're outgoing is because they're trying to be validated by being accepted amongst their peers. 
most people who are very secure, they, they do not seek acceptance. So that causes a sense of alienation, particularly amongst the insecure, because they're, the, the attitude of the insecure is, who do you think you are to not want to be accepted by me and everyone else? I went through it. You have to, you have to go through the same thing. So, you know, oftentimes insecure people will try to project their insecurities on people who are very secure. Kobe Bryant is someone who is very secure in who he is. So he does not feel the need to win you over. And that offends people. And that's something that's very pervasive in society. This is why Colin Cowherd tried to try to juxtapose Kobe Bryant with Shaquille O'Neal and Magic Johnson. Two people who would be described as quote unquote outgoing. But people who are outgoing, extremely outgoing, tend to be two types of people. Um, they tend to be either people who are trying to hide who they are, who they really are. Or they're people who are trying to project an image of who they wish they were. And there's nothing against people who are who are very, very outgoing. There are exceptions to that rule. Sometimes they just are, you know, are you know what we call extra. They go above and beyond to express themselves and win people over. But I found in my life that most extremely extroverted people that you know they're trying to you know they're trying to project an image of who they wish they were. And they figure if they can convince you to believe that that's who they really are, then they can embrace that persona. And that can be who they are. Most extroverted people are very insecure. Nothing against people who are extroverted. If that's you, that's you. But you'll always find that people who need to be validated by others, they, um, they get triggered by people like a Kobe Bryant or people who are self-validated. Even though, I, even though I address certain things about Kobe, no, I do not believe that he's a top 10 player. He's very secure in who he is. Kobe's never been embraceable. And, and well, maybe he doesn't care to be embraced. And somebody, Rob Parker went to this, said it was totally subdued. It was, and I mean, again, if you go look at Kobe's speech, I think you used the word sterile and the, about the whole deal. I go to his speech, and it wasn't emotional. It wasn't uh, celebrating his teammates who helped his accomplishment. A lot of times when people are there to celebrate you, uh, the people that are being celebrated will say, well, let me tell you who you should really celebrate. Right. Phil Jackson, Derek Fish. I don't even think Kobe noted Jerry West. Yeah. <laughs> well, I believe that he did note Jerry West. But beyond that, as long as Kobe's being who he is, it doesn't matter. If Kobe was to come on, it was to come in front of the microphone and act as if he was really magnanimous and so concerned about how other teammates have benefited him in his career, that would go against brand. I would expect him to respect his teammates, to honor their um, their contributions. But for Kobe Bryant to grab the mic and be deferential to other people, that goes against brand. That goes against psychological archetype. That would go against what made him great. So instead of trying to nitpick what he didn't do or didn't say, respect him for being genuine. <laughs> uh, or Jerry Buss, any... any you celebrate all that you use that time to celebrate everyone else. Kobe's a different dude. I don't think uh, I wouldn't put him in a category of like, I think he's a bad guy or anything like that. Uh, he's a flawed human being who to me is very fascinating. I don't know why people use that term flawed human being. That's a redundancy. To be a human being is to be flawed. Um, Jason Whitlock, brother, look in the mirror. That's the only time that you'll see your penis. You're flawed. OK, if you look down, you, you won't see anything other than stomach. We're all flawed. It's OK. Um, so you have been on this for geez, two months that you said there was trouble coming for the Seahawks. Well, shit, I've been saying that for the last six months. I give Whitlock credit. He, he caught on a little earlier than the rest of you guys. But I've been saying that on this channel for the last five or six months. That Seattle wasn't going to win shit because they was a woke team. I guarantee you, you go ahead and, and, and find anywhere else where they were telling you that Michael Bennett was bugged out of his mind. I was talking about him from the time that he levied his first attack against Stephen A. Smith. I, have, I did a video called Boule Negro versus Woke Negro. And I told you, brothers, what was coming in regards to him. 
And I told you, brothers, that that whole mentality was meant to try to implode the NFL. Now, look at what they say here about the Seattle Seahawks, what Pete Carroll is finally admitting. And I'm from Seattle, so I have a certain affinity. I love Russell Wilson, and I know Pete Carroll. But you've been on this for two months, and you said this thing, it doesn't work long term. Empowering the players, all these clicks. So Pete Carroll came out yesterday and said, we got way too many clicks in this locker room. No shit, this is what you tolerated. When you, when you overly empower players that are uh, mentally unstable particularly like a Michael Bennett or an overrated intellect like a Richard Sherman. That's like these people who get into these tumultuous relationships. You always get in arguments with your significant other. You're always breaking up and making up and all these huge fights and the police getting called to your house and you become addicted to di- you become addicted to dysfunctionality. That is what happened with the Seattle Seahawks. They got too many woke niggas on their team. And everybody there is just clamoring for attention. And if you'll notice, those are, a lot of those niggas on Seattle, they're the same guys that you'll see on the NFL commercials talking about how much they love the American troops. They don't, they don't know what the fuck they want to stand for. A lot of those guys have too much feminine energy. I don't care how much you bench press if you got the spirit of a female on you. All those muscles are in vain. Between Michael Bennett and Richard Sherman and Doug Baldwin and all these guys, they're just bugged out, man. And I stated after they lost to New England, that team would never, ever be the same. That team was traumatized by Pete Carroll's call at the end of that game. Or if you, I mean, or, or Daryl Bevel, whoever made that call, the offensive coordinator, they would never be the same. That team was a bully team. They wanted to bully their way through everyone. And as soon as they faced any adversity, they imploded. And this whole woke mini movement that's going on in Seattle is a compensation tactic for the Seattle Seahawks. That's a way for them to try to take attention away from how hurt they still are by what occurred in that Super Bowl. They've never gotten over it. And what did you see two months ago that I didn't see and nobody else saw? And you were saying it and people were saying, Whitlock, you're stirring stuff up, you're being political. You called out what Pete said yesterday. It's not about football in Seattle. And at the end of the day... You're being paid millions of dollars to go win a championship and football. And the values that have always been in football and in sports about coming together despite our differences, leaving politics out of this and let's just do our job. Michael Bennett and Doug Baldwin invited all of that into the Seattle locker room. And uh, yeah, because they were bored, they were idle. And they have a lot of feminine energy. And they were dead set on begging the, you know, begging their daddy, their proverbial daddy, the Caucasian man, for that hug. Very unfortunate. But I told you guys when I made the Michael Bennett video to watch out for him. And again, there's always been this racial politics around Russell Wilson that comes from that locker room. And I can remember at one point early in the year, Richard Sherman was saying, oh man. Russell Wilson was down for us, and, you know, this is the first time. And They were talking about Russell Wilson in a way that had nothing to do with football. Because the reason why they kept talking about Russell Wilson is very simple. Um, What they did was they used the the fake pro-black angle to attack Russell because they were jealous of the fact that, in their view, he was getting too much praise for their success. The so-called Legion of Boom wanted everyone to believe that they were the sole reason why the team was successful. But anyway, that's basically Whitlock's take on those two issues. I tend to agree with the majority of what he said, but we'll see what the updates will be on the Seattle Seahawks. Things are not going to end well for them because they're led by their emotions. But anyway, peace.